Got it. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, tonight, um, well, the reason um, we're having this Zoom actually is because um, one of our dear families, Rich um, Dufty, passed away recently and um, the family um, used the services of um, Katie. Um, and Wolo itself had been sort of looking for a um, sole midwife or deaf doula for a little while. So it's just, it's come at really good timing that, that we met you, Katie, and that you're coming to do a talk for us. And you're also a funeral celebrant as mm -hmm. well. So um, thank you for coming along and um, sharing some of your, um, what's the word? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. What, what my waffle essentially your waffle yes yeah, so it's not what that, I'm waffling I'll pass <laughs> over to you and then you can um you oh. can tell us all about what you do thank you thank you well thank you for having me and yeah thank you for I'm, I'm so glad this has happened and I'm so grateful to Rich um and to Emma as well for just allowing all of us to kind of share their story I know how passionate Rich was and how he told me about you guys and how supportive Wolo had been so you played a huge part in his life you know, as much as his death and his dying, it was his life as well that you managed to enrich, which um, I know he was eternally grateful for, um, as was Emma. So, yeah, so and Emma and Rich got in touch with me um, when Rich had no further options. He had been told when he was in Brighton Hospital that um, it was now uh, palliative treatment. And one of the reasons I think Emma reached out was because actually no one really explained what that meant. So there was this sudden new shift in their journey in which is physical health the mental perspective now needed to change this was just a huge now right one thing had stopped and we're starting something else and what the heck do we do so that's essentially where emma and a friend of hers a friend of her had seen me an article that i did in a newspaper previous uh, earlier in the year and said oh maybe we should look into that and i know that emma had also had support from an australian organization of someone she knew with organizing death doulas so it was in the ether and then when they found me and they said I wonder if she's local and I happen to be 30 minutes up the road so thankfully the stars aligned um uh, so yeah and they, they got in touch because I am a soul midwife also known as a death doula some people have often heard of a birth doula um and recognize that that support and that um resource if you like is somebody that you know just obviously walks alongside you as you're about to give birth you're creating this life it's hugely, hugely overwhelming life change, physically, mentally, and emotionally. And we we actively encourage that support to have somebody alongside us through that birth journey. I just don't understand why we don't do the same and then some with death when it is even more emotive and challenging. So that's essentially what we do as soul midwives. We do exactly the same, but the other end of life. And that is why our name is as such as well. So a midwife helps this soul into the world. And a soul midwife supports the transition of the soul at the, other, at the other end. There is death doula training and people call themselves death doulas, soul midwives, end of life therapists, end of life companions, soul doulas. There are many actually different training schools available in the UK of uh, practitioner training, of diplomas, of, of care, of all sorts of ways that we can do this. You just pick the training that sort of resonates with you, which is why I did the soul midwife training. There is about a thousand of us soul midwives all over the UK. So this isn't something new. This isn't some kind of new age um, thing, you know, to, to be focusing so much on death. Actually, what we are is one of the oldest, we're playing one of the oldest roles that our, our culture has had as human beings. There was always somebody at the bedside of the dying. There was always, I consider myself the crone or hag of the village. But I'll take that. I'm happily that 5,000 year old hag with the long grey hair and sitting there with a blanket round her howling at the moon. Like that's me through and through. But th that's what we had. That's what our culture had. And that is what many other cultures and countries and faiths still have. They have that village of support. They have a tribe of people where everybody has a role. And there is often that person that will hold space, that will be present while people are dying, that will organise the village or that will you know, change the environment sing uh, songs, read mantra, uh, sorry, read prayer, recite mantra, you know, all of those different cultural ritualistic things that we do have, we've kind of forgotten. So the soul midwifery is about just bringing that back into the heart of the home. So we're not doing anything new, we're doing actually what we should instinctively be doing as communities. So that's it, hopefully helps the understanding of what a soul midwife is. 
And my role as a soul midwife incorporates a lot more. So every soul midwife will have their way of working in a way that they support the dying. Mine just happens to be with my voice. I say that my voice is my superpower. Um, but also my my history and my experience is in community and palliative care anyway. I was working in domiciliary care, left, started 11 years ago. I was then supporting all the palliative packages, packages of care in the community. Um, I then went to work at my local hospice where I still am, where I do one day a week on the community team. Then that's when I took on the soul midwifery about six years ago. And then I added on funeral celebrancy and I've since then also created a death education program to, to bring in all of those 11 years of experience I've got about dying to make it readily available for people. Because with my voice and being able to talk so freely, honestly, always from the heart, but actually I've got that knowledge and experience of what it is to be dying in the community. I understand the district nurses, the GPs, the paperwork, the funding that might be available, the resources, the charities, you know, I, I that's where my experience lies. So that's what I bring to the table as a sole midwife. And I think that was another reason why Emma and Rich got in touch with me is was to help them figure out what they do next from the bigger picture perspective. Like, where do we go with this? We're in a hospital. And then that's when we had some really valuable conversations about, well, do we want to stay in hospital? What are the options now? What is care going to look like if we go home um what is care going to look like if we go to a hospice and then what is what what's that going to look like for our family how is that what are we what are our girls going to have to contend with in rich and emma's sake you know situation they had two young girls what is life going to be like for them if dad is going to come home and be cared for at home you know is the dining room table will have to move because a hospital bed might come in how are they going to feel about that where do the girls sit and do their homework or their drawing is daddy going to be able to be in the same room? You know, all of those logistical things that we don't necessarily think to think about. That's where, thankfully, my experience as a soul midwife is is as is such that it is absolutely about that community um, end of life care. So a lot of the support I did, and I'm talking about Rich and Emma as an example, because they are a perfect example of kind of what I do through the whole, all of my um, roles, if you like. I supported them before, during and after death. So with them, the first part of it was really to obviously meet with them. And I met with Rich in the hospital and spent about three hours with them. And we just talked. And sometimes having that extra person in the room that is impartial, that can be a sounding board, that I can offer guidance and advice and actual facts and information. But actually, I just having me there allowed them to bounce off me to have a conversation between each other. I can't fix or rescue anything that that's not what I'm there to do. I'm not there to make everything OK. I'm there to support people to have whatever moment they need to have. So for Rich and Emma, it was about we need to figure out we need to understand this. So I did offer information. I did offer guidance. But then what that allowed them to do was to talk to each other with that newfound information, you know, like going home. What does this look like? How do how do we do that? How's that going to work with the girls? How do you feel? And they're hard. They're hard conversations. There was a lot of tears from both sides. But what there also was was so much love, which they had in abundance between the two of them anyway. But what the love and respect they had for each other allowed a whole new level of honesty. And that's, I think, really what we need in life as well as then in death. Talking about the reality of what that might look like, how that makes them feel, and also what classically happens when somebody becomes poorly in a partnership is that that person then worries about that person and that person worries about that person. Then this person won't necessarily say anything so they don't want to upset them. And this person says, well, I can't say that because they're upset. Out of nothing but love, but then, then this becomes this block. Part of my role has been quite often to help build, you know, break down that wall of worrying what the other person thinks. There's not that sometimes it's a case of we can't there's no time for that now. The only thing we've got left now is this honesty. This is what's happening. It's and having someone like me can help, like I said, break that down and open those uh, doors and open those new channels of communication that we never even thought we would we'd need to have. Because we always have hope. You know, we always hope that the, we're never going to have to have these conversations. So in comes Katie to be able to go, OK, but now we are. That, but it's done with love and that holding space of, OK, but now I can provide the information and I can hold this space for us to figure out, for you to figure out where we go from here. 
So, you know, that, that, but that's just, again, what part of my skill set. I also have 20 years in management. So a lot of the communication skills and the awareness and the understanding and the facilitating difficult conversations has come from that as well. So some soul midwives may just focus on the, maybe the bedside vigil side of dying. Some soul midwives may focus on the advanced care planning early on. Some soul midwives may focus on legal stuff because that's their history. You know, we all bring something to the table, but that is part of my gift and my work and obviously part of the reason why Rich and Emma got in touch. So, and I, I've only just read, um, Sam sent me the email and the link for tonight about the lovely words that Emma had shared about the fact that, you know, we did support them through through the whole thing. And I got a bit emotional because I hadn't seen those words from Emma. Um, but like I said, it was it was from hospital to hospice and then his memorial and his farewell. So we had some really tough conversations in the hospital and then we discussed about where he wanted to be when he died. And that then opened up the conversations of going home, which he did manage to do for a few hours. Thanks to my understanding, not thanks to me, but thanks to my understanding of the community, I was able to look and go, right, well, what resources are available and can we do this? And there is always a way around things and they're too important not to. So I'm a bit like a dog with a bone. We will make this happen. But again, that comes with my understanding and actually talking to the consultants in the hospital. You know, I can be that bridge for people. I can be that that go to that. And also that kind of that lackey, if you like, from a communication perspective, I can be the one that has the conversation with the consultant to also go, OK, this is what I know about the community. Consultant goes, this is what they, is going on with their health. I can go, right, well, this is what the community can offer. And they can go, right, well, we can sort out the meds. Do you know, it, it, again, it's that village. It's everybody coming together to support that person. So I can be that network and that bridge for people as well. So in Richard's situation, we did manage to get him home for a few hours before he came back to the hospital and then transferred over to the hospice. And then my role kind of shifts into he's being cared for in a different way. Hospice treatment and palliative treatment is very much comfort and support. People move from hospital to hospice because we can't fix, we can't cure, we can't rescue. The body starts to get so poorly that there is no going back. And that's where the hospice care for Rich in that situation really came into play to manage his physical symptoms. And I think it's really important to note as well, one thing I try and discuss with people, and my son actually said something to me the other day about, because I speak very openly with him. He said about somebody needing medicine because they were dying. And I said, they don't need medicine because they're dying. They need medicine because of the reason they're dying. I'm sorry if you can hear my neighbor's dogs barking, sorry. Um, so what, what happens is, so for Richard's situation, his illness was causing him pain. It's not the dying that causes pain. And that's something I think plays into everybody's fear of death and dying, regardless of whether we're you know near the end of our life or not. We all have that worry of pain or of how it's going to be. Is it going to be difficult? Am I going to struggle? Am I going to suffer? Or we're seeing our people in difficult situations. But actually, I think it helps to understand that the death bit is the natural non-painful bit it's the illness bit so that's also what we worked with and where I could support Emma and Rich's family to understand what was happening in him physically and in him emotionally so he didn't have an easy ride for a few days it was a pretty bumpy process very much more from an emotional perspective and there's again a big part of my role could be and it was for Rich and Emma is to look at the idea and explain to people about the idea of total pain and this is something that isn't, uh, doctors will recognise it, but again, we don't necessarily talk about it enough early on. So Dame Cicely Saunders is the incredible lady that set up the whole hospice movement back in the 60s because she recognised her husband, who was only 60-odd, where he was dying. In fact, I don't even think he was 60. The hospital wasn't right. There was nothing more the hospital could do. Back in the 60s, there might have been some kind of like rehab type facilities or um, not rehab, what's the word? not respite, convalescence. There might be some kind of convalescent homes, you know, there was those, those kind of facilities or there was church, but there was actually nowhere for anybody to go to just have that love and support as they're dying. So she, she's the one that created the hospice movement. And another reason she created it is because she recognized what they call, what we now call total pain. And this is where somebody's dying or approaching the end of their life and they may have, or, or say they have a physical pain. So my head hurts. They've got a pounding headache. And sometimes the medicine just doesn't quite cut it. And it's because maybe it isn't just physical pain. It's total pain. 
it's spiritual pain, it's emotional pain, it's mental anguish, it's fear, you know, it's 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 struggle, it's anger. It's all of those difficult emotions, and that's why sometimes the medicine doesn't quite cut it. But this is where somebody like myself or a more emotional support can come into play. So what we did again with Emma and with Rich um, is very much recognize that what if we can't get on top of the physical pain and if he is in physical pain, the medicine is doing what it can possibly do. But what else can we do to help him and soothe him? And that's where I helped have conversations with the family about recognizing this total pain. We talked about talking to Rich about things that soothe him, sharing memories, laughing. It's okay to laugh and smile around death and dying. It's actually very comforting and it's part of life. So there was lots of storytelling around Rich. There was lots of hand holding. There was lots of I love yous. There was lots of you're safe. It was that emotional support that he needed more than anything. And I often say to people as well, whether it's me or, or actual you know, medical professionals that are with somebody, what a family or a village and or your people around you, you will be able to do more than the medicine ever will. Because even the medicine that will go, yes, OK, have the medicine, it tells the brain or the pain receptors in the brain to go, right, send the pain meds to my knee because my knee hurts. What happens is when it's total pain, those pain receptors aren't going off. So it, that's why then it won't go to the knee because the knee, yes, is hurting, but it's, it's it's another trigger. It's something different. And to soothe and comfort that, all actually we need is love. And that sounds really cheesy, but it's so true. We just need companionship. We just need support. We need to feel heard. We need to feel validated. We need to feel like we matter. And a lot of the work that we did with Emma and Rich was he knew he was loved. It wasn't about that. It was about allowing space for him to want, maybe to not be completely okay, but to let them know that they loved him anyway, to let him know that he may have been struggling, but they were not going anywhere. You know, he may have been in pain, but there was support around him and he was not alone. That's, that's what kind of gives people the comfort and support. And it's the same as if we're struggling in life and we've got stuff going on. If your mate comes in with 50, you know, 500 solutions and goes, oh, don't worry about it. Everything will be fine. You don't feel comforted and soothed by that. You, you know, no one ever calms down from being told to calm down. <laughs> like, it, that's just not how we work. We calm down when somebody says, oh, my goodness, I can see you're really upset. Do you want to tell me what happened? I, God, I, God, I'm not surprised you're upset. That's really big deal. I'm, I, I can see what, you know, of course you'd be angry. What can I do to help you? That's where we then calm down and go, oh, wow, someone's listening to me. Someone's like, oh, you want to help? Oh, great. So I'm not on my own. OK, we, that's how it is in life. And that we forget to do that in death because it's almost like we've become so detached and divorced from death and we put it over there and leave it down to the medical professionals. But what about, like I said, then when the medicine doesn't work? What about when they can't fix it? That's when we need to rally back round to be by people to go, it's OK, I'm here. You're not on your own. So a lot of the work we did with Rich in the hospice was very much that because there was nothing else to do. And that's the other difficult thing. We often feel a bit lost when we can't do anything. And we forget, you know, we are human beings. We're not human doings. And again, cheesy. I love all these little cheesy quotes. So, but we, you know, but we, we don't know how to just be. Because we, we, we feel like we should be doing something to be helpful. So again, part of my role is not just necessarily to support the person that's dying. It is also then very much about supporting the family to go. The best thing you can do is be. To just be present. So I say we did that, but also a big part of my role as a soul midwife. Sorry, Sam, I see you've got your hand up. I'll just on a roll. Otherwise, I'll forget. Um, one thing we did with Rich and one thing that I do as a soul midwife is help create legacies and memories and do a lot of work with people about what is important to them. Maybe it is about their funeral or farewell, but actually maybe it's about things that we can do before somebody dies. And this can be done weeks, months, years in advance. And we had this um, incredible company called Heart in Their Hand that make little trinkets and keepsakes. So Emma and the family, um, we got a load of those made for the girls. We had their names engraved and they enabled some really powerful connections between Rich and every single member of his family that had some keepsake and trinket. And his mum and dad kind of looked at it and went, OK, like, that, that, you know, they, they in that moment, they were like, OK, it was a bit of metal. Why is this going to make it any better? Like you silly woman. However, at Rich's farewell, 
his mum came up to me with with this key ring. She said, I haven't let go of it since. And she was like, I get it now. So a part of my work as well is to support people to figure out how do we create memories? How do we create maybe new rituals? Are there rituals or things that are important to you that we need to be doing now or sooner rather than later or things that we need to do now that support people later on? You know, there's so many options about what we can do around death, dying, living, more importantly, you know, leaving a legacy, creating memories, creating memory boxes, leaving your favorite recipe behind for your family. You know, all of those things that the family traditions that you have. Part of my work is to help people figure out what we do with all of that, if anything, in a way that's going to support them going forward. Sorry, Sam. That's fine, actually. It, it You kind of sort of answered um, my question, but what, what I wanted to sort of know within your role was that, um, you know, sometimes we can all decide or think about what we want. And then when we get caught up in the emotional side of things, things can not get forgotten, but get put to the side because our emotions and everything take over. So, you know, if, for instance, you you have a partner that is is dying um, and you know you know what they they would like, but your emotion is is very strong and you're not maybe able to articulate that for your partner to mm -hmm. medical um, professionals. With, with, that's where you would come in. But would you, is your job to remind that partner of what it is the dying person wants or would you actually, you know, are there times where you have to step in with the medical profession and say this is what's, this is what the um the patient would like or the dying person would like and and also do you find that you you know do you have to remind the person themselves and bring it back to this this is this is what you wanted um mm. you know is this still the case yeah so there is a certain level of advocacy in my role so for exactly those situations but there's also uh, we change and yeah. So, so a big part of if I because I work with people that maybe have a diagnosis, but they're not terminal. So people come to me with whatever their situation and go, do you know what? I just want to start getting organized. I've got a young family or I have a business or I have a lot of money or I don't have a lot of money or I have a lot of stuff. You know, when there's a lot of things in our life that we think I need to get organized, people will come to me and we can work together to plan it. We can look at things from a um, uh, not professional, like a an official perspective of respect forms like the DNA CPR, wills, lasting power of attorney. We, I, I don't do it, but I can signpost and work with people to figure out the technical stuff. But also what we also do is then look at our wishes. So I've created a document which is available and free to download on my website. It's called Me, My Care and I. And it is about what comforts me, what soothes me, where do I want to be, what's important to me, what matters. And I will work with that document with people from as early on as we need to, to think about how they might want their dying journey to be when it comes to things like where they want to be. Do you want the ritualistic side of things? Do you want a candle lit? Do you want somebody to read the newspaper to you every morning? You know, that in itself is a ritual. And then, and then you just kind of have to go with the journey. So people's wishes then might change. And also there is an element of somebody may, for example, so ad, you know, I'm absolutely adamant I want to die in a hospice. But we have to then look at the reality of what if there's not a bed? What if actually you plateau and you have difficult symptoms to manage, but hospice care is normally for only a few weeks at a time? So if you, if you then your prognosis is a bit longer, but you have difficult symptoms, do we have to look at the option of a nursing home? Or are you absolutely adamant you want to stay at home? OK, but then what about if and when we might need other equipment in the home? Is there room? Do you know what I mean? So we can all have wishes, but also what we also need to do is look at a plan A, B, C, D and how we feel about those things. So and I, again, I can't say to anybody what's right or wrong. There is no right or wrong. My, my work then is to work with maybe that person that's dying. Maybe they don't have actually anybody else. So maybe I am the advocate and we document everything and they have. There's a book I've got called What My Family Need to Know. It's like $9.99 on Amazon. Everybody can get them. And I've got all of my stuff documented. So God forbid, I'm not going, you know, touch wood, I'm not going anywhere soon. But my family then can pick up the book and they know everything about what I need and want. So I might be that person that has that information in that book for somebody. But equally, then I might be that person that, again, is bridging that gap between family members or between village members, if you like. 
Because the other thing is, the reality is not everybody's a loved one. <laughs> yeah. So when it comes to family and dynamics, I'm often in I'm often asked in, invited into people's lives because I might be literally playing devil's advocate. So my job is to just explore everybody's options and feelings about any given situation. And it might be that I remind them, or do you remember we spoke about the idea of having these little trinket key rings made? Is that something? No, I can't think about that. Okay. Would you like me to do something on your behalf? Yeah, yeah, fine. Just get on with it. Uh, if I've been worth supporting people for a while, I will then know if that's something that I can go, yeah, do you know what? I'm going to do it or I'm going to get one and then I'm just going to leave it and then we're going to have a talk about it and see how it feels. Do you know what I mean? There are ways, I, I can't say that there is a set way to work with anybody because everybody, as we all are, we're also weird and wonderful and unique in our own ways. And how everybody does this bit, if we are poorly or if we are approaching the end of our life or we get a diagnosis or our mortality is questioned, it changes us. And the person that we were before that would have maybe done uh, dealt with a situation one way. Suddenly our own reality is totally different. So we deal with it in a completely different way. So, yeah, I I, I have to be flexible, <laughs> you know, because but also I realize none of this is about me either. So I can be flexible. I'm just there excuse me, in whatever capacity people need me to be. So maybe it is advocating, maybe it is reminding, maybe it is encouraging. If I know that actually that was really important, I can I, I can do what I can. Or maybe it is standing alongside the medical professionals to go, look, there is no bed at the hospice. So we have to look at a plan B. Do you, know, you know, so it might be that. But this is why I'm grateful for my own experience professionally, having all of that insider information about hospices, beds, forms, GP, you know, and all that kind of stuff. It takes a lot of pressure off, doesn't it? You know, you having all of that. Thank, I'm so glad I do because we don't know what we don't know. Hmm. So when somebody That's gets right. a diagnosis and yeah, and then you're you're thrown out there after this diagnosis and the doctor says, oh no, you'll be fine for a while. Come back to me with any problems. And you're like, uh, uh, like, like uh, uh, there, there are no words. Like, where do you even go from there? So I'm so grateful that having like, me, particularly with that information, I can sit and go, okay, right. Do we need a district nursing team? Let's get a referral from the GP. What what does your hospital have? Is it McMillan or is it Marie Curie? What foundations and charities are local? You know, and then I can signpost. A big part of my role might just be signposting. Maybe I'm not actually doing anything, but I'm signposting and then off they go. So I can, I can uh, you know, give people that information about the resources that are available locally to them and also things that they might be um, actually entitled to. You know, there are grants that you can get to have your bathroom turned into a wet room. You know, different like West Sussex uh, County Council is different to Mid Sussex, and there are different things that you can do in different areas, and different funding and support are available. So I might be the person that just helps them investigate that, get the forms for blue badges, and, and you know, and things like that. So, yeah, so it's a very long winded answer to your very good question. Oh, it's great. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. The other Fleur's got her hand up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I've got a few questions. Go for it. Making a few notes. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting. It's um, interesting. Me and Fleur talking while you were talking. It's like, even it's so, so personal, isn't it? Like, some things you're saying, like, Fleur goes, really? What do you think that? Or, like, like it's it's so different. Like, oh, her absolutely. opinion, to my opinion, or, like, just stuff. But yeah. again, it's what you said. It, it creates conversation. You know, if you weren't sitting there, we wouldn't have talked about that. Um, that and now that's one of my kind of questions, really, that how, how do you get over it if you've got different feelings like a couple's got different feelings about it so I'm of the opinion that I want to get all organized you know because I never know what's going to happen right now you don't know what's around the corner whereas Justin feels um he'd feel hurt and upset if I started planning it mm -hmm. because I think about it mm -hmm. yeah, it's almost like I never want to see you if that makes sense it's like all the time you're not there it's like it's great but I, I get it I understand it and I'm that classic case of like, yeah, don't deal with it. I can imagine that, that I'm that person probably. And I guess also it's really raw, isn't it? Because if you're diagnosed, I was diagnosed six years ago and, you know, Macmillan started talking to Justin about planning my funeral and he was like, nah, this is not for me. And obviously I, I'm absolutely fine now, touch wood. Um, and that was six years ago. And actually, you know, there'd be a lot of people that aren't ready to to speak to you Um when they face their mortality, because they don't know when it's actually going to be. But yeah. as time goes on and treatment options, you know, recurrences might happen or treatment options 
diminish mm-hmm. that's kind of when you're actually facing the reality and have got to kind of pull your pull your socks up and and actually sort it out mm-hmm. um so I think in my case, I'd like to do it all way before that ever happens while everybody's healthy. Whereas Justin, I think would prefer to do it. Well, I'm like a newbie. So this is all new. To, you know, we've gone through lots of yeah. death stuff, me and Fleur growing up mm. and probably learned the hard way. Mm. So listening to you is really refreshing because mm. we didn't even knew this stuff existed or whatever. And, you know, I get also being a, a parent and stuff like, you know, even like now we turn it down, the kids walk in the room and this and that. It's, it's very whole, triggering. You know, it's like the whole death. You know, it's weird, isn't it? It's just. Yeah. And I think that's what what you just said is really interesting. I also did a couple of presentations for a, a local cancer support group for me recently, one on song midwifery and one on funerals. And a couple of the ladies that came to the, the song midwifery one, one of them was actually quite angry and was almost resentful of herself for being there. She really struggled with this. She had a huge fear, a lot going on for her. And she was like, I'll probably leave. I'm going to leave. I'm, you're just going to have to let me leave. I was like, that is absolutely fine. You do what you need to do. And it was like a, a, a trigger warning of, you know, this is how I talk. This is, we are going to talk about death. This is what, no, 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 no I just, I just can't, just leave me alone. Okay. She came back to the funeral workshop. Mm-hmm. She, she was like, she's not she said I'm not cured she said but I I like there's a bit of a weight lifted and like I'm a little bit better with everything and the, the anger wasn't there mm-hmm. and I think what you just said just you know this is really refreshing I think when you have people that are very understandably don't want to go there can't do this because it's too hard mm-hmm. it, it, it's the hardest thing but then when they do there's that realization of oh that wasn't quite as bad as I thought like yeah oh, it was, oh it was bad and it felt hideous but I survived. Like and I got through that conversation. And that's the other thing I wanted to say, just to make everybody else aware, was that um, we've obviously been talking about Rich and Emma, and, and Emma, I've spoken to Emma, and she's happy for me to discuss um, them with you. Um, but she, Rich reached out to us um, probably about a month before he started. So when he spoke to me then. Yeah. yeah. And he was really worried that Emma was just... Okay, yeah, I remember. She, she, she wouldn't sport, talk about it. She didn't want to talk yeah. about it. Rich felt that she was avoiding the, the subject. He felt really awkward because he didn't want to upset her. And he really wanted to open those channels of communications, but she wasn't open to it. And it's only when things deteriorated a little bit and then they got in touch with, or we got in touch with you, mm-hmm. that actually everything changed from that point oh, onwards. Yeah. And now she's written that, obviously, that uh, thing that yeah. says, you know, she wishes she'd met you sooner than she did because actually it really helped to open those avenues and it wasn't awkward at all and um it it really so that was kind of an example of you know the apprehension and sticking your head in the sand and not wanting to actually deal with the realization that your partner's dying i think from i remember the the, the call so i took the call of rich and and it so you know went along the lines of he realized the drug trial wasn't working or gonna work and he realised he was feeling more poorly. And he spoke with, well, myself, and he was like, I can't get myself to have the conversation with Emma because she's in denial. Mm-hmm. How do I do that? There's my own opinion and there's Fleur's opinion in that, but there wasn't someone like you to go, they almost need someone to help, like you say, open them both up to enable Rich to have that conversation because he knew he wasn't getting better. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he admitted it to me but he couldn't get himself to say that to Emma. Mm. And I guess it seems easier, but I can't comment because I've never been there, but I can imagine when you're in that state and you've got your partner and your your loved ones, that, that is going to be the hardest thing, everything you probably have got to do in your life. Um, yeah. I can imagine, I don't know, but, and that's why you're there. That's why we're here, I suppose. That's why we yeah. listen. You know, we, I just, you know, I was a bit weird coming even on the call. You know, I, there's something against, me feeling these feelings so originally i was just going to sit over there and just listen while you were chatting and it sort of draws you in a bit it's weird i think it's a bit like that morbid curiosity you know when everybody slows down past a car Mm. crash it's awful but it's what happens you know everyone just go even if it's to go oh god that's awful i can't look you still look to make sure you can't look Mm -hmm. there's something in us Mm. because it's something that we are all curious about we know it's going to happen But obviously it creates the hardest, most challenging, heaviest feelings within us. 
even if you me, have, Casey, yeah. even chatting to you, even meeting you like the last few months and talking this and that, it's open conversations up with my parents. Mm. You know, yeah, see that's and do you know what? And I do hear this a lot because I think it helps that. And this is where, again, I consider myself gifted. Like I said, I joke with my voice is my superpower, but I speak very openly I and I speak from the heart. So if I was to sit here really monotone, not really bothering and looking and going like, yeah, well, you know, when people die, like you wouldn't be engaged. It would be like, oh, you don't believe what I'm saying. Like, I'm not, but I speak authentically and I, I talk honestly because I'm in it. So I'm not just this person that's read a book and gone, oh, do you know what you need? My whole work, my world, my heart is in end of life care, and it has been for eleven years. So yeah, when I'm and sharing, I'm lucky enough to good. see that firsthand, Katie, and I appreciate that because as soon as I saw you and heard things and that, and I was like, my God, like you, we need you. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's the thing. I mean, we weren't in the position to actually say to Rich, "Oh, have you thought about um this?" Because we we'd contacted um, Living Well, Dying Well, and yeah. you know, we've heard of death doulas and their death cafes and stuff, but mm. it it wasn't you know I'm just you know thankful that his legacy lives on and that we've met you and that we're able to offer your services now to the families that we're supporting because I feel it goes really hand in hand with our ethos about um trying to make the most of our lives um we yeah, know, live each day yeah. and actually you can help us you can help anybody live like that until they pass on Absolutely. And and this is the thing, going back to what you were saying about the conversations, I am, I am friends with and have met uh, uh, Dr. Catherine Mannix. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like this is the equivalent of name dropping in this world. Um, she's the most incredible palliative care doctor and has written the most amazing books on. So one's called With the End in Mind and the other one is called Listen. So she's been a, 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 an incredible Highly achieved. Why don't we put those links in the chat, Sam, and stuff for any resource? Because eh? it's fascinating. I love all these little name yeah, drop the books. things. And and she make one notes and then um send them to people after the after the yeah. Zoom. Yeah, I've made a note. Um, but one thing she has said in her books, and she says to me every time that we've spoken, she was like, "No one's ever told me they wish they talked less." Yeah. What they wish is that they had have talked more. Mm. And I can honestly say, hand on heart, again in the eleven years I've been doing this. To not have that, I totally understand how difficult it is to have those conversations. I, I, of course, I absolutely get, like when Rich rung you up and said, uh, mm. what do I do? Emma won't face it. I, I understand and feel that pain of what the heck, what do the hell do you do when somebody won't talk or they're in, like, where the hell do you start? And I think I feel so passionately about at least trying to, you can't always make people talk. Like I said, I can't fix and rescue anything. I can't make anybody do anything, but I can at least try and hold that space there's ways of asking or ways of tackling problems and listening to people and open it you know there are things that I can support families or people or couples you know think exactly what we do yeah exactly exactly yeah. <laughs> um so but what I say to people as well is that you think not having that you think having this conversation is hard not having it is harder mm. and it's a harsh reality and if I can speak so you know boldly with people I will say to them how are you going to feel after they're gone and you haven't said these things like you think it's difficult now, but especially for the people that are left behind, if it's the people left behind. So say, for example, it was the other way with Emma and Rich. If Emma wasn't able to express herself to Rich, I've said to people before, but it's hard to do it now when he's here. It's impossible to do it when he's gone. And, and that unfortunately is the reality. Sometimes it's like, if it's that important to you, you need to say it now. Yeah. But this is why I am such a huge advocate for doing all of this now. Like while we're well, like my affairs are sorted. My book, my funeral wishes, everything I want for my death. Like right now, I know I don't want to die at home. I love my home, it's my haven, but it's the only home my son's ever known and he's 12. So I know he will struggle if I die here. So right now, my wishes is that I would love to go to a hospice. But what I also recognize, like I said, there may not be a bed. I may not be able to get in. So then I'm prepared to go, okay, maybe I'll go to a nursing home. Do you know what? So I'm willing to have those conversations and those things are all documented. So what can I do now? I can live. Mm -hmm. I parked it. It's done. My wishes, a plan A, B, C, D is all written down. I can crack on. And, and that's the value in it is the difficult conversations are difficult. They are emotive. There will be emotion. Like I, I, Again, I, I can't sit there and say to people that having a conversation with me will make it all fluffy and lovely and all okay. It won't. 
But what it will do is open up those channels of communication. There will be a weight lifted. And I know, like I said, hand on heart, in the 11 years I've been doing this, it is a damn sight worse to leave it. And there are so many benefits that come out of doing it now. And that, yeah, okay. so that was one question asked that keeps going around in my head here. And, and I, I know our opinion would be different, but at what point do people, I know there's no right answer, but seriously, when is the right time to talk to yourself? I think as soon as you know your life is going to change, that I think is when we start need to reassessing. Whether it is a case of a diagnosis, um, no, no, nobody may say it's terminal. Obviously, we all live in hope, and we we pray that we we get through these things, and we yep. know we've got a tough period of our life ahead of us, and we hope that everything works and things, yeah, get better. Yeah, there's no negative in not doing it. No, I know, I understand. That's, that's it. No, I get that's it. Exactly I get it. it. Yeah, it's it's I, it's I'm so a... um it's just interesting on another level. It really yeah. is. And I think I think this is the thing. It's about recognizing what's right for you as a person, like how you talk, how you talk with your family, the kind of things you maybe do or don't talk about. And it's also thinking about how do you work? Like some people journal and write stuff. So maybe that's a way to do it. Some people paint. You know, finding a way to find your voice and expressing yourself, but do it in a way that's natural. That's Don't try and have a conversation in a way that's not authentic if that's not how you work or how your emotions work. You know, you can tap this into any part of life and do it in a way that works for you. So it's all personal. It's all bespoke to you, but we've got to find it within ourselves somewhere to at least bring it to the forefront. Sorry. Yes. Sam or Claire, I don't know. I didn't see hands. Um I was just I was just thinking about you know what we were saying about um you know once you've you've said it you can then you know concentrate on living and I and I think as well for the people that you are leaving behind if you can articulate that to them and they can make sure that everything's in place that you wished for mm -hmm. when you are gone it almost takes away some of that sadness and and I'm just drawing on you know my own experience that you know with with my dad I was able to to do everything that he asked for and when he did pass away, of course, I was sad for me because he had gone, but I was really proud and really happy that I was able to, you know, fulfill all his wishes and have the songs that he wanted at his funeral and, and do the things that he wanted to do. And, and that took away those what ifs or, oh, you know, because yeah. we had those conversations. So you are able then to to remember in a fond way rather than if only I had had that conversation or if only and yeah. I feel like it's quite a healthy departure then oh, absolutely. you've got them to the other side in one piece you've got them there with love you've got them there with you know with everything that they wanted and you've got them to the other side side safely and that meant a lot to everyone that was left behind yes. And you give what he what he gave you as a gift. Yeah. This is the way I think it helps to see it is you give each other a gift. If and it may be that actually you never talk about it. Maybe it's written on a post-it note. And I say that to people, even if you can't talk, and maybe if you don't want to get a book and you can't do the whole conversation, maybe it's just a post-it. Maybe it's a post-it that will say, no hospital, must play Elvis, pink flowers. Do you know what it, it and, and that could be your funeral? Maybe it's about your death that says um, you know, um, no ventilation, no blood transfusions, no antibiotics. If you, do you know what I mean? No, no resuscitation, something like write it on a post-it of just a couple of things that are absolutely, absolutely your non-negotiables, you know, and it might be a faith thing. For example, Jehovah's Witnesses traditionally wouldn't necessarily have a blood transfusion. So maybe it's stuff like that. Maybe somebody doesn't want to talk and do the paperwork, but they write it down on a post-it note. Like something, it doesn't always mean it's legally binding, of course, but it is is class and expression of wishes, which will be taken to, into account by all people involved. So it can literally be as simple as a post-it note, but you give somebody a gift with that post-it note. So he gave you a gift of not just knowing stuff, but of that peace of mind. Yeah. Grief is very loaded and layered and grief very naturally comes with guilt and it comes with regret. Even in, even in the absolute best of circumstances, that's what it comes with. So 
if you've got regret and guilt in the most beautiful of situations and the most open of conversations, you can imagine how much more difficult it is when you haven't had them, when that guilt and regret is already there anyway. It's so much heavier when there is no conversation. So yeah, he he gave you a real gift and that's the thing. And the lady that I, I said that came to the workshop that was really adamant and angry and didn't want to come back, she said that it was when we said that that she realised she was denying her partner any information because she just would not discuss it. And then she she hadn't thought about the from the perspective of, well, if I get hit by a bus, he hasn't got a clue because I've never told him. Yeah. So more it tapped into her then to go, that's not fair. I love him too much to leave this world knowing that then he's going to struggle even more when I've held that information. And again, th that that's for her. That was her work. That was her realisation. Everybody else will have their own stuff. But it's an important realisation to have about the recognition of that gift. So, yeah, thank you, Sam. Claire, hello. Hi, Katie. Hello. Apologies, I was a little bit late to the start of it as well. Um, I wanted to ask you about your experience of working with people from other cultures. Oh, okay, yeah. Who often have very different views on death and dying. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and how that works, how your role fits into that. Where I, In my experience of working with people in other cultures, death and, death and dying is, mu is much more um, talked about and... Yeah comfortable and it's very british the kind of things that you've all talked about tonight can't can't talk about it don't want to it's too painful yeah it's very british actually yeah. it's very very stiff, stiff upper lip isn't it yeah it's, yeah so, so is, and is there anything to learn i guess from other cult cultures and always i said in the beginning that's kind of where the soul midwifery comes from all i'm doing is bringing death back into the heart of the home which is what many other cultures countries and faiths still do yeah so, and it's interesting, I have been invited into other families, um, uh, uh, all sorts of actually different religions. What's interesting now in modern day is that a lot of religions or a lot of cultures and faith um, and faiths are almost diluted purely for the fact that modern day is different. For example, I um, was invited in by a Muslim family, by the daughter, although because traditionally she was doing all of mum's care which was exactly how the family wanted it. The men had a certain role within the house and the prayer at different times of day. And it was her role to look after mum's physical needs. But what she was struggling with is the fact that she's got a career. She has a career. She had the potential for a promotion. Yet, obviously, mum's expectation is, well, why are you going to work? You should be here with me. This is what you do. So the mum's idea about the daughter's role was really traditional. She was a very devout Muslim. And the daughter, although was very devout to her own faith, also was living in 2023. Mm. You know, so, but interesting, my role, if I'm in, what I found is that if I've been invited in by somebody of a different faith, it's not to support their faith, it's to support them as a human being. It's yeah. to help them understand, okay, maybe we do need a referral to a hospice. Maybe we need to go back to the hospital for the palliative care team to actually figure out what mum's meds need to change to or something. I'm normally there to help signposting and to help again conversations. They most face will face exactly like you said will have their idea of death and dying. They don't need me to come in and tell them their view. They have their view. What they might need is extra support to go like for the daughter. She just needed a sounding board. She needed someone to understand that she absolutely wanted to look after her mum, but she was adamant she wanted this promotion. And she recognised, you know, after mum's gone, what if I've missed the opportunity? I've got a family. I've got a mortgage to pay. You know, the life stuff that actually traditionally her mum didn't work. So, you know, there's all. So that's when I say that faith's diluted. It's all those little changes that have happened that, the, the, you know, the rituals um, around death and dying within a faith based community have shifted. But but equally, the elders of the of the community in most religions will still step up and do what I consider myself to be doing, like that crone or hag. Um, I said that in the beginning. I say that with love. I don't mind being a hag. Um that they will have that person because they are still working in that community village tribe kind of situation in most other faiths. Mm -hmm. And actually what's also really interesting is even if they're struggling with, with the dying bit, and even if they're struggling with the logistics, like the daughter and the care and who does this and the house and, you know, the modern day things, as well as the practicalities now of, of community care, what most other faiths have is the idea of what happens after death. 
there is something within their faith uh, that basically supports or comforts them with the idea of what happens to their person afterwards. So a lot of other cultures will find a lot of comfort in actually maybe it's irrelevant how the dying bit goes. They just need to make sure that they have whatever gifts that they offer. You know, in Hindu faith, for example, they offer fruit and, you know, flowers and the coins on the eyes and things like that. So actually, that's the most important bit. The, the bit before, maybe there isn't actually much ritual. Maybe their their faith isn't about that. It's about the after bit. So, again, I, I have worked with I'm, I'm, and I love my work. Um, it's so multicultural. You know, and I, my work is non-denominational. So I support all faiths and none. I am just that person that brings the information, the voice, you know, to have the conversation and figure out how we can make this already difficult situation a little bit calmer or a little bit gentler. You know, so it's so and I always go in. I don't have an agenda. So people often call me as well and don't really know what they need. No. But it, because obviously they're in a panic and it's everything sucks you know they're not in a situation they want to be in and it's like where the heck do we go now so I always will then meet with people and then it, everything kind of evolves however it's meant to evolve yeah. so but yeah I, I have such a huge I am a huge advocate for faith I have a very deep spiritual faith and I believe things that absolutely help and support me in my work and I in my experience faith is hugely supportive even if it's none you know, even if you are, if you, if you have some idea in your head of what you believe about death, dying, the afterlife or not, or the purpose of life, you know, the, the, the meaning of life, whatever our faith is about something bigger than us, it plays a huge part in how people get through the last part of their journey. It's really interesting. Thank you. I've got one more question. Okay. Um, for, for, have you ever been involved as well? I don't know if it's part of your role where where people perhaps don't have anybody mm. and and like in your title, I envisage a midwife, you know, helps you deliver a baby. Do you actually hold somebody's hand in them at last moments of life yeah. where there isn't? Okay. Yeah, I have seen, I, and I've, I've said this more recently, I've seen hundreds of people take their last breath, but I wonder now, even if I'm working on thousands after kind of 11 years, but that's essentially right. what a soul midwife is. A midwife helps a baby in and a yeah. soul midwife helps the soul transition at the other end. Right. So I am often called in for maybe that bedside vigil. Maybe it is a case of, um, doc, and I know me and Fleur talked about this, I think, and Sam briefly before, there's this idea of social prescribing. So GPs or, you know, healthcare uh, settings can socially prescribe somebody. And there are some situations, every area is different, which is a bit annoying, but they can prescribe like a sole midwife to somebody that maybe doesn't have anybody. Right. You know, as well as getting them referred to hospices and everything else. So, you know, to, to have, they can prescribe a social, a, a sole midwife or a death doula or, or something of the like to be that person. I've been called in when people have had nobody, but I've also been called in when people have lots of people. But for whatever reason, they can't or don't want to be there. So this is the other thing. So, and I said as well at some point, I don't know if you were here for that, but not everybody's a loved one. No. So, you know, you might have lots of family. Doesn't mean you like any of them. Yeah. yeah. Or you may have some lovely family, but the relationship does just not allow for that fact that you cannot watch them leave this earth. Or you cannot do the physical caring. You know, it's a big role shift and a change in dynamic when a child has to then become the parent and help their and change their parents incontinence pad. You know, that's a whole other level of, of grief, of mate, of frustration, of sadness, but also maybe there is pride and joy that comes out of that as well. You know, this is such a layered thing when you, when the roles and dynamics change between people, because there is an expectation of family to do those roles in the community because the resources, you can have a package of care. You can have carers come in but if you how you are living in the same household with people, there will be things that as that person, as the person you're living with, there will be things that you'll have to do that you won't want to do. Or you might do willingly. You know, there's all of that stuff as well. So I'm often called in for a lot of those reasons. So it could be that nobody's there, but it could be that everybody's there. But I'm that extra. And some people don't want to be there when their person dies. So it's a case of can you come in because I just can't stand the thought of them being on their own but we can't be there, you know, or maybe I'm helping the family create ritual. Maybe I'm helping them figure out how we create that ideal bedside vigil for that person. I looked after a young lad um, once early twenties and he did not want silence. He didn't want what I lovingly refer to as like elevator music. I love all that. 
he was like, I don't want any of that. Excuse my French. Don't want any of that shit. So it was Guns N' Roses. It was Guns N' Roses all the time. It was people in the room. It was chaos. It was noisy. It was high energy. That's what he wanted because he couldn't stand the thought of having the silence. So what we did as a family was I helped his mum more so work with the fact that she was like, I just want everybody out of the house. This is too much. I just want, and it's like, but he didn't want the quiet. That was too much for him. So it was absolute chaos. So me and the mum worked on things that we could do for her and moments she could have with him to create her own kind of rituals. You know, moments with him holding his hand, brushing his hair, rubbing hand cream in, you know, all those little things that you can do for people that you wouldn't necessarily think to do or even know that you can do. Yeah. So, yeah. So, again, slight tangent. And I haven't even covered funerals yet and it's already nine o'clock. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, but yes, thank you. For, yes, I am there in all sorts of situations and I am there literally for the last breaths. Um, and what does it look like, to, your role, to be there for the last breaths? What, 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 what do you do? Is it just sitting with people? Is it, I mean, if they're a, a religious family, you may be reading prayers or is it all of it? I, I it? It's whatever people need it to be. Okay. It's whatever people need. So it could be reading prayer, reciting mantra. It could be reading the football scores. It, yeah. But most of the time, and again, I said this earlier on, I don't, sorry, Claire, I don't know when you joined in. Um, it's very much about the being. Mm. when somebody's when it gets to the point where somebody is actively dying and the body is actively shutting down there is nothing to do no this is the hard this is one of the hardest things yes they may need medicine yes there might be care so somebody might need to be physically moved continence that kind of thing mouth care up to a point but again you wouldn't be doing that either when somebody's actively dying so when it gets to the point where somebody is i want to say actively dying i mean the body is getting ready to to stop altogether so you're talking about in the last minutes to hours possibly days but that last very that last very stint it is just about being present if you want to be mm -hmm. it is just about making sure that the lighting's not too bright maybe or the noises aren't too loud or they are loud depending on what somebody maybe has talked about it's about knowing what soothes somebody what creates a calming environment what's important to them is it the lord's prayer on repeat or is it having the telly on with loose women on in the background you know, is it is it reading a book to somebody? Is it putting hand cream on? Is it just chatting to them about memories of holidays? A lot of the time it's about just reassuring them that they are safe and they are loved and actually there's nothing to worry about and everything's taken care of. You know, and so if a family had said, you know, it, I would just love to talk about holidays yeah. and, a, and a family was struggling with that, would you facilitate those conversations? If that's what they asked me to do, absolutely. Right. I don't have an agenda. Like I said, I, I no. don't go in going, right, this is what you need to do when your person dies. And that I think is also where people do call me because we all have an agenda for our person. We all think we know best. We all think that we can help and because we do and we can. But equally, I come in being completely impartial, completely objective and can help navigate all of this because it will be different and it is different for every single person. Every single person, although the physical body might go through a typical natural dying process, which is very similar for a lot of us. The reason we're dying obviously is unique to us. Our bodies are unique to us and who we are plays a huge part in how we die. So there can't be a tick box exercise for dying. I can't go in and go, right, well, I've got a whole toolbox and a whole wealth of knowledge and experience to bring to the table. But I certainly can't go, right, well, this is what we're going to do today. <laughs> you know, because we just don't work like that. No. I will do whatever people need me to do. And interestingly, people will, like I said, they won't know why they're ringing me, but they might call me and then we talk about different things. I can talk to them about, well, have you thought about maybe just turning the big light off and putting the little one on? And it's things simple that, that people might not go, oh, why didn't I think of that? It's like, well, because you're in the middle of losing your person. That's mm -hmm. why you think about the light switches. And this is exactly why I'm here. You know, so it could be very seemingly simple things and changes that I can help somebody with to the bigger stuff of life planning, funeral planning and, you know, holding bedside vigil with ritual and prayer. You know, it doesn't have to be anything big. It could just be very, very simple things. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. I feel like I should stop there. I mean, I could, I could do this all night, but I'm sure everybody's got better things to do. Mm. Obviously, the only thing I haven't talked about really is the funerals, but that again, maybe that's a whole separate meeting. You know, maybe we do that again 
and just talk about different ways to do funeral because Rich did it differently. You know, he, he didn't want a funeral. He wanted an event was what he called it. And he wanted, he was obviously went into a natural burial ground. Uh, we had a, an incredible ceremony for that. And then we had a whole other separate thing on a whole separate day with a completely different vibe done in a completely different way, because you can do that with funerals. There are minimal to no laws about how you do a funeral. The only legalities come into how we dispose of our physical bodies. But other than that, how we celebrate them, the rituals around that, how we mourn, how we grieve, how we honour, how we share, we can do in a million different ways. And that's another thing I'm a huge advocate for is choice and autonomy. So we figured out, and again, Rich and Emma didn't know half of the things they could do because we don't know what we don't know. So thankfully, I can come in with a bit of, well, if you don't want to do that, why don't we do this? And have you thought about that? And I wonder if we can do this. And it's just a conversation again. And that's what I love what I do, though, as well, doing it the kind of before, during and after. If I am supporting somebody in some way with soul midwifery, quite often they will then come back and ask me to do their funeral because I know them. I've had something and you know, there's a connection there somewhere. And even if I just help in the beginning and then I don't have anything to do with them, they'll come back and go, do you remember you helped my dad two years ago and we put everything in place? Well, you know, he has since died, but we'd love you to do his service because you know him. And it's great because then like, and I said it in Rich's, but then, then there's no strangers there then. You, you know, and it's such a lovely feeling. You can feel it in the room as well, can't you? When you go to somebody's funeral, you can feel that, you know, the celebrant, it, when they do know them, you can actually feel that rather yeah, than yeah. Thinking they're just reading from a, a script or whatever yeah. the family said about them. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's, again, I love my celebrant role though as well, because people have even said to me, oh, so you knew them then? And I might go, no, but I love that you think I did. Yeah. You know, that it's like, yes, I've done a, jo a job well done there. So even if I haven't met them, obviously I do a lot of work for a lot of people I haven't met. But a lot of people also contact me because of the work that I do, because I don't do weddings, I don't do naming ceremonies. So they'll come to me really actually appreciating and liking the fact that I like that you only do funerals. I like that you actually get what my person has potentially gone through. Like, you know, I'm not just going to any celebrant that's got, you know, again, that's done a wedding yesterday, then does a funeral and then has got a christening the day after and has got a template that they've used. Sadly, that is how it works for some. That's not how I do it. No. my set my celebrancy as is as unique and bespoke as my soul midwifery okay but yeah maybe more on that another time Thank any you. other questions is there any other questions i i just think it's i for something that's going to happen to all of us like being born you yeah. know we are all going to die. I find it really refreshing that we can we can talk about this and um, hopefully get to a point, you know, if we explore it and get to a point where, you know, we are able to trust the process mm, because yeah. it, it is going to happen, you know, and if we can be, you know, feel not, I think comfortable is not well yeah comfortable yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not there yet but I would like to feel comfortable that I could actually you know know that it's going to happen one day and I trust that it's going to be okay and it's just the natural way of things and it's not anything yeah. to be scared of um and I think that's the same for a lot of well everybody really isn't it is that we just want to trust the process because it's going to happen and I think that's such a valuable point death is natural yeah the reason we're dying might not be natural. The age at which we die may not be natural. There are many things that make this not okay, of course. But it's going to happen at some point. Yeah. And like I said, being in the thick of it, I you know, I imagine there are many of your families that may be looking and watching this going, I, you know, I don't want to do that yet. I, I absolutely don't want to do that. And I totally get that. I just really hope that on some level, even if it's a case, like you guys have said, even if somebody watches this and goes, well, I'm not calling her, she's irritating. But isn't it interesting what she said about this? And then that sparks a conversation, maybe not with them, but maybe their family. But even the, having the conversations and doing this allows this then to go out to other people if they choose to watch it. But then that might have a conversation with somebody else, which then has a conversation with somebody's hairdresser. This is why I do a lot of what I do. I share so much on social media as well for this exact reason, just putting it out there. And if people choose to engage, great. If they don't, fine. But there's always something that comes back where somebody will say, oh, do you know what? You said that the other day and I didn't know that you could be buried in your back garden. Yeah. 
And then that will have a conversation. And then somebody will say, oh, do you know what? That's funny because I heard a story about. And then they'll tell somebody else and it'll be like, oh, actually, I didn't know you wanted that. And so then I know that five was it six degrees of separation or whatever someone over there has had a really valuable conversation that they wouldn't have had had i not waffled on on facebook one time do you know what I mean that's the value and the power of this you just don't know where it will go so i hope someone somewhere will get something from this yeah and if and if we 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 can put a link to your um facebook and your um website on our yeah website or people can email you direct or course, um, you know through through us so if anyone does want to get in contact with you then yep. you know we can give them the means to do so absolutely and even if it is a case of just having a look on my social media like um jane said she followed me on social media and found it really interesting yeah. maybe that's what people want to do for now yeah yeah maybe that's it. just to know that there is something on there online and there's, there's lots of information on my website, but the stuff I share on Facebook and, and Instagram, I do like my dying for a cuppers. Yeah. So I post like a bit of a death cafe. I do a dying for a cuppa every four, six weeks ish. And I pick a topic and I just waffle on about it on Facebook live for half an hour. People can comment and engage if they want, or they don't have to. And then it's just out there and all the videos. There's about 40 videos of different topics of things that I've covered so far. So someone even messaged me the other day and was like, oh, my God, I'm, you know, I'm 15 in. I'm like, good grief. Are you bored? Like, <laughs> why have you messaged me now as well to talk to me? You must be sick of me. But because they've got, they're in a situation now and now it's relevant, but they're loving the fact that it's just there. They can do the washing up and have me waffling on in the background, but they're going, oh, God, oh, I didn't think about that. And they're writing down now, you know, that they need to buy light and dark towels if they're looking after somebody at home because just for obvious reasons dark towels you'd have a light flannel for your face and a dark flannel for your bottom half do you know what I mean? those little bits of, of helpful information and that she's like i never thought about that so now that's completely changed how she's going to look after her person so there's so much but that's all that again there's so much of that stuff that i can just go on about all day <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop talking fascinating now. thank you so much it's been amazing no thank you for inviting me along and like i said yeah i just hope i hope someone somewhere finds something useful in this or you know and again has a conversation somewhere yeah i'm sure they will and we'll definitely put all the links on our our website and our um our group chat um oh, so, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and we'll be sending the recording out to um people that want to yep. want to see it so thank you so much it's been no thank you thank, yeah thank you for having me and thank you for everybody for chatting away and um yeah being here thank you uh, and i think there'll definitely be more chats to come yeah, good. I, mean, yeah. I'm, I love doing this because, I, again, I know the benefits. And like I said, with the workshop I did, the people that came back that never thought they were even going to come to the first one. So I'd really love to think, hopefully, if people want to do this again, I am more than happy to just... Maybe I'll just come along and answer questions. Yeah. Maybe it's just a case of, oh, that woman does that. Maybe she'll know. Do you know, you know if, if, even if I don't know, maybe I can help people figure out where we find the answer. Yeah, we're actually going to do an info about Wolo Day. Um, oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah uh, where we're going to invite, well, you if you'd like to come, <laughs> and lots of other people that we um, that we also use, um, because I think it'd be really helpful for people just to meet everyone face to face, find out actually how Wolo can help support them and their family through, you know, their cancer journey, whatever that may be, because every cancer journey is different. Yeah. Um, so we'd love you to be involved in that. Um, and yeah. to be able to take questions from people um we can put out who's going to be there you know beforehand and everybody's links and stuff or introductions or whatever it might be so that they can you know either come armed with some questions and make a beeline for people or they're just there to find out what we do and um listen and observe and plant the seed for then yeah. another time you exactly. know um exactly. so yeah, yeah we'd love you to be part of that yeah, Thank you. I found it invaluable. And if, has any has anyone else got any questions about anything? Or um, if not, then we'll send out a little um, links and things afterwards, and maybe a little questionnaire about how helpful you found it, or what you'd like to talk about next. Yeah. Because I'd like to talk about funerals. I'd like to talk about mm -hmm. your death education course, mm -hmm. um, and um, a bit more about maybe palliative care. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah, maybe yeah. about how you how you support children that sort of thing um yeah. so lots of different subjects um maybe you've covered them all i don't know with your dying for a cuppa um but you might be would... in there somewhere but i mean say people trawling all through them i'll just do it i'll just do it again <laughs> so, but also it's interesting because again 
obviously every time I share a personal story, it's because somebody has allowed me to. So if I work with people, I will say to them, you know, are you happy for me to share about the work that we've done? And it may not be with names and it's not very specific, but I just want people to know that I'm going to use the examples of what we've experienced for the greater good. So what's interesting is that although I may have done these dying for a cuppers over the last couple of years, I'm always learning. Like every day is a school day. I learn about myself. People are fascinating. You know, I love what I do. I'm blessed with experiences every day. So actually there's, there's always something new to talk about, especially with things like children, you know, and it's every, you know, we are so unique as our children. Our relationships with our children are so unique. So there's no right or wrong way to do that. But I've also done some work with um, a couple of child psychologists and child social workers and stuff, again, for my own learning. So I'm making sure that I'm sort of supporting in the best way possible. So, and that's some of that stuff's been recent. So yeah, there's always stuff to share. And as you know, now I've always got something to say. So <laughs> <laughs> You're in good company. <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> and also, I guess I should probably say, if people do think, actually, I'd love the idea of a soul midwife, but that Katie really is too much for me. Not every soul midwife's like me. You know, so if somebody thinks I want a soul midwife, but I so I prefer somebody that was ABC, like I can support that as well. It's not, I'm not the only one. And it's certainly, I don't want people to think they, I'm the only option. Like I'm one of many, you know, there's so many incredible people and friends and colleagues I have that, Maybe someone actually wants somebody, but it's not me. And that's absolutely fine. Like if you just want somebody, I will figure out who the best person is or give you lots of contacts of the people. And then you can make those connections and see who, who feels right. Do you know what I mean? Cause we all click with different people for different reasons. And yeah. this work is too important to just have somebody because you think, oh, well, I'll just go with Katie. She's the only choice. It's like, I'm absolutely not. There is a whole wealth of people out there that are doing incredible things. So just want people to know that as well, that it's you know, not everybody talks as much as I do um and but we can absolutely find the right person for you if they really want somebody thank you thanks thank you thank you you're very welcome thank you well yeah sorry it's gone over and i've taken up your evening but thank you very much again no not at all not at all so yeah thank you and if no one's got any more questions we're dying for a cuppa yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, decaf. Decaf. yeah i really need my diet i need decaf, De decaf and a bit of chocolate but yeah, that would do me nicely. Yeah, biscuit, yeah. I think. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. Right, Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Thanks. You're all right. Lots yeah. of love. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.